All right, so I want to come everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, special series. And it's a series that touches upon Palestine. Um, it's a new approach. In other words, it's not just uh, critiquing how bad things are um, and um, complaining, it's analyzing. It's uh, looking into uh, potential areas uh, for change and looking at it from an American perspective. Uh, the United States is involved in so many crises throughout the world. This is probably the one issue where the United States is on the side. Um, well, let me just put it another way. It, 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 it has the ability to change the situation more in, in Palestine than anywhere else in the world because of the financing, the military supplies to the state of Israel uh, and the political protection, the political cover it provides um, uh, in, in, at the United Nations. Uh, so our tax dollars are involved directly uh, on, on this issue involving the Palestinians and in nowhere, no other part of the world uh, is it involved uh, to such an extent. Uh, so we have a great series uh, as uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the program covering uh, the short history of Palestine and attempts at its erasure in Western culture uh, to uh, the issue of uh, war crimes. Um, and that'll be next week with Munal Khalil who has worked at the United Nations and an expert on international law. We'll be talking about United States responsibility in terms of war crimes. And then we're gonna hear perspectives from uh, members uh, uh, of uh, the Jewish community David Myers, uh, who is a professor of history at UCLA, will talk about history of Zionism. And I think it's, it behooves us to hear that perspective. Um, and uh, after that, Jeremy Ben-Ami and Peter Beinart will discuss a Jewish home versus a Jewish state uh, and, and where the thinking is changing there. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, we'll be talking to Ken Roth, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, which declared that what is happening in Palestine is apartheid. Uh, and then after that, we'll be looking at the nexus of anti-Palestine rhetoric uh, and uh, Islamophobia and its impact on the American Muslim identity with Sarah Tantawi, professor at Fordham University. So we have a, a great lineup and I'm so excited that the lead off uh, is Hussein Ibish. Uh, Hussein is, is a scholar in, in many ways. He has spoken at uh, MPAC conventions in the past. Um, at that time, I believe Hussein was the communications director for the ADC, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Uh, he also served uh, on the, uh, the task force uh, for, for Palestine. Um, he writes uh, for uh, the uh, American Task Force for Palestine uh, and exec executive director of the Foundation for Arab American Leadership. Um, he uh, also writes for uh, Bloomberg Opinion and The National. And um, he monitors, covers, and analyzes what's happening in uh, Arab Gulf states as it relates to the region. So he is an expert and we're, we're very glad to, to have, have him. And we want him to talk about a short history of Palestine and attempts at its erasure uh, in America. And I, you know, we, can, we can talk about this dating back to, I believe the words of Golda Meir when she came up with the phrase, a land without a people for a people without a land uh, in terms of uh, Jewish uh, immigration uh, to Palestine. So that, um, We'll start. We'll we'll hand it off to Hussein Ibish to start off. And uh, Hussein, thank you again for for joining us. We're re really honored and privileged to have you. Oh, thank you, Salam. Good to be with you. You have a, a really great um, set of speakers coming up, so I uh, know could hardly have done better. So it's it's great to uh, to be part of that. I, I do appreciate it. I, I want to talk about the way. Um, Palestine and Palestinians have been perceived and not perceived in the United States um, culturally and politically in terms of our discourse uh, here in the United States over time and, and look at the themes that have characterized 
the way in which Palestinians have been characterized, caricatured, elided, erased, um, or papered over with some sort of, uh, as I say, caricature um, over time. And because all the, it's really interesting, although almost all of those um, deep-seated ideas uh, are still prevalent. They can be found somewhere in our culture, right? They are not necessarily all operating with similar to your force that they used to have or that each other have, but, but they are all still out there. And, and then I, I think we should look a bit at the uh, structures that have helped to uh, create what is in the end a striking imbalance between uh, the way uh, Israel and Israelis have been perceived, understood, appreciated, sympathized with, empathized with, and ultimately therefore supported by Americans, and the way Palestinians have not been uh, any of those things. Although, as you noted, there, there is some change uh, going on right now. So the uh, I'll, I'll try to take you through a chronology here and link the development of the narrative of Palestine and the Palestinians in, in American culture with different phases in, the, in Palestinian history and the Palestinian-American relationship. I think that's the best way of doing it. And then end up looking at the structures. So, you know, initially, I think it's, I'm not going to get into the fraught issue of when the Palestinians became Palestinians in a, in a final irrevocable way. In other words, when Palestinians acquired a national identity that really finally distinguished them from the other Arabs of uh, the Levant. Uh, I, I mean, I would say it's somewhere uh, in during the mandate and, and above all the Nakba, the dispossession and displacement of the Palestinians, which affected all Palestinians, including uh, those who stayed in northern Israel and the Galilee, uh, everybody who experienced the destruction of that society. And uh, that's something that that's an experience that's absolutely unique to Palestinians. And, and by, you know, once that was experienced, I think it, it was, it was, there was no going back. You can trace the, the idea of the Arabs of Palestine having a particular you know, consciousness and, and even to some extent, uh, national inklings and national agenda to the late 19th century. And it's, it's certainly once the first pan-Arab state in Damascus fell to the French in 1922, I think it became increasingly clear uh, to Palestinians that they were on their own and that they were, whether they particularly wanted to be Palestinians, that's what they were going to be um, or not. It, it didn't matter that that, that was um, necessary for uh, their survival. Uh, but I, I, I think the outside world was much slower to perceive the emergence of a, a distinctive Palestinian people. And the, the first period of um, Palestinian history after the Nakba, I, I mean, I think in other words, if we were to say in the United States, there wasn't an appreciation of a Palestinian people. There was an understanding that there was a war in Palestine uh, between uh, Jews and Arabs, and that there was a conflict, and there was a debate in the UN, and uh, you know there was an understanding that there were Arabs in Palestine, and they were part of the uh, the, the political process of the society under the mandate, etc. Um, but in night, but they you know they were really never referred to as Palestinians, and and there was very little understanding of of who they were, very little interest. It was just the Arabs who happened to be there. During the period immediately after, so from 1948 to 1967, the only real um, image of Palestinians in the United States is of the, and it wouldn't even have been called Palestinians, they would have been called the Arab, insofar as anyone knew of them, they would have been called the Arab refugees. Uh, I think there was more of a recognition of their existence in, in Britain uh, because the British felt um, somewhat more directly responsible for the Nakba. Uh, but there was this trope um, that came about in the, in the late 40s of, of the Arab refugees 
from Palestine. And they were just generally, wherever there was an effort to raise money from the, 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 the Arab refugees. And that's really who people were talking to, uh, talking about when they mentioned the Arab refugees. It's the first way of distinguishing uh, the Palestinians from other Arabs. And so th this gives us then the first two um, themes that we need to keep in mind. The first is that Palestinians have been unknown. So in the, in the um, certainly before 1948, they were unknown. And, they, and even between 48 and 67, their existence was known but their existence as a, as a national society, as a people, as a movement, it was not known. And insofar as there was any discussion of them at all, which as I say, was more common in Europe than in the United States, but did happen here sometimes among certain uh, journalists and elites and whatnot. Uh, you know, it was, the, it was simply as generic refugees. And, and the refugees give Palestinians one of their, uh, one of the tropes that hangs on them to this day of a people who are simply displaced pathetic victims, a people without agency, a people without, uh, it's almost a subhuman status in the sense of people who are simply victims, but not victims of anything in particular, they just happen to be suffering. And, uh, you know, probably it's their own fault or it doesn't matter. The context is not important. The, the fact is there are these wretched people who live under terrible circumstances, good grief. And so I think there's very little about Palestinians in American discourse between 48 and 67, except in this form as refugees. So now you have the unknown uh, function and the refugee trope. The refugee trope is not dead. It's, it's definitely not dead. After 1967, between 1967 and 1973, 1967 was a, you, you get a new, a new trope, which is the trope of the Palestinians as terrorists, right? This is, this then becomes, you know, the real sense that, okay, there are Palestinians. Uh, a couple of things happened during this period. Obviously, you have the founding of the PLO and therefore the, in 1964 and its revivification in 1967 and 68 in the context of the, the occupation and the catastrophic 67 war with Israel. Um, you have the uh, emergence again onto the stage of world history of the Palestinian people, of the Palestinian national movement with organizations and with um, a voice and an entity and whatnot. And 1967 was crucial in the United States because it, 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 the ripple effects of how the conflict in Palestine impacted American culture was was absolutely transformed in 1967. Right? The, the six, before the 67 war, there was generalized support for Israel, but it wasn't particularly strong. Israel's main backing foreign power was France. They got most of their weaponry from France. And in the United States also, the Jewish community was pro-Israel, but in a very quiet way. They were still of traumatized by the Holocaust, uh, strong memories of the anti-Semitism of the interwar period between World War I and World War II is very pronounced anti-Semitism in the United States, a real fear uh, of pushing uh, Jewish influence in a parochial Jewish issue too far and causing a backlash. And I think there were some mixed feelings about Israel um, because the, the Zionism had not become a hegemonic um, Jewish belief until 50s, 40s, 50s. It's certainly a post-Holocaust phenomenon. And um, you know, I think it took some time. It was 1967 war that was uh, perceived almost messianically uh, among not just Jewish Americans, but Americans in general, as a kind of redemption, as a kind of glorious conquest of David versus Goliath. And also, the reclamation by uh, Jews of the entire uh, supposed land of Israel, um, you know, was was seen. Uh, I think it inspired the imagination of a lot of Christians, uh, especially evangelical Christians. It's it, it certainly changed the Jewish attitude towards Israel, where uh, Israel became the main organizing force in uh, Jewish uh, civic society in non-religious life. And even to some extent, the defining issue of the Jewish community for a generation or two after 1967. Uh, so this 
um, sort of is gives rise to a strong, aggressive American support for Israel and uh, a, a real campaign to cast the politically reborn Palestinians as a dangerous menace, as terrorists. It also, by the way, galvanized the beginning of the Arab American identity. I think before 1967, there really, it didn't mean anything to say you were an Arab American. There were Egyptians and Lebanese and you know, others, but mainly Lebanese, Syrians, et cetera. Uh, but then they really kind of functioned almost like uh, Greek or Armenian Americans. The Muslim issue was was a difference, but the, the community was much more skewed towards Arab American Christians at the time. The demographics have changed. And I think, uh, the, you know, before 1967, it was kind of an undifferentiated, hyphenated kind of uh, almost Southern European uh, trans-Caucasian identity. Um, for the Arab Americans and no, no sense of themselves as a community. And 1967 shocked them into um, uh, an awakening that they had a collective interest and they had a collective experience and they, they needed to organize, particularly seeing the issue being so rapturously received by their fellow Americans. And so you get the birth of the first Arab American organizations, the uh, uh, Arab American University graduates, uh, which leads to then the, the creation of the first Arab American organizations, which sets the stage then for uh, eventually the creation of the uh, Muslim American political organizations as well. Um, so it's a turning point in that sense as well. Culturally, as I say, you start to get the proliferation of aggressively pro-Israeli propaganda, anti-Palestinian propaganda in the United States. And it's when you see the issuing of the book, the Leon Yoris book, Exodus, which defined the Israeli-Palestinian issue for a whole generation of Americans. It's extremely um, uh, aggressive Israeli propaganda. It's been correctly said of that book that the only good Palestinian or Arab in it is is a dead one, quite literally. And uh, it is it is sort of a uh, an extremely um, uh, it's a radicalized version of the Israeli narrative. Of the, of, of the 1940s. And it was turned into a very popular film with Paul Newman. And it, I think, was extremely important in setting the stage for perceiving Palestinians as bad people who only brought their fate on themselves and who, um, and it, it started, it was the inklings of the idea that these are really terrorists, that these are really dangerous people and, and to be feared and, and mistrusted. Obviously the terrorist theme remains a, a major problem uh, to this day. But I mean, it's still in many senses, one of the main things Americans think of when, when they think, many Americans think of when they think of Palestine and Palestinians. Um, this got much worse uh, after 1973, between 1973 and 82 and 67, and I'll explain the other bookend there for a second, you get uh, a really aggressive Islamophobia, and anti-Arab, not Islamophobia, anti-Arab racism in the American media. The oil shock of 1973, the, the um, Arab-Israeli war of 1973, and the oil embargo uh, created a, a, an outpouring of anti-Arab sentiment in American popular culture. And it got linked to the Palestinians, got linked to Israel. The, the, uh, the two main uh, sort of caricatures of the villainous Arab got uh, fixated in that period in the 1970s in American popular culture. One was the greedy, filthy, horrible, um, corrupt, avaricious, predatory oil sheikh. Uh, who is kind of the uh, a revivified version of the Jewish money lender, uh, kind of Shylock, and the uh, bomb throwing, crazy, radical Arab terrorist, probably a Palestinian in in most cases a Palestinian, who is the uh, a revivified version of the other anti-Semitic trope of the uh, crazed bomb throwing Jewish revolutionary, uh, and this dominated. If you go back and and look, it's hard to appreciate now, especially for younger people who were around the seventies, but the extent extent to which American popular culture in the 70s and the 80s was dominated by uh, these two tropes, these two kinds of villainous characters is just remarkable. It was everywhere. 
ev absolutely everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other thing that happens during this period after 1973, the, the, um, uh, the heyday of the Hollywood anti-Arab agitation and anti-Palestinian agitation uh, and the creation of the Palestinian terrorists as an arch villain in American popular culture is the birth of an evangelical narrative after the 1973 war, which, which, you know, you still see this stuff today. There's a tendency on the part of um, uh, some Christian evangelicals, and it's actually a very big community in the United States, who, not just the evangelicals, the evangelicals who tend to do this, to take the Bible, especially the Old Testament and the Book of Revelation, and read them as if they were the A section of the New York Times. We do absolutely, literally, no metaphorical anything, uh, no just um, in just literalizing it and trying to figure out who in the news represents which group of goodies or baddies in uh, the books of the Old Testament or the prophecies, the very vague prophecies of the, uh, especially of the book of Revelations. And there's been a constant set of, of um, narratives about how to read the present moment and immediate future uh, of political history in the world through the Book of Revelations that that has uh, had a different arch villain. You know, um, it used to be the Soviet Union, then it was China, then it was Iran, then it was. It doesn't matter who. Generally speaking, these stories tend to have a uh, the Battle of Armageddon, but in the fields of Megiddo or in some. Uh, way, there would be a giant conflagration between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and the children of light will defeat the children of darkness, and the second coming will come, and all of that stuff. And uh, in that narrative, um, Israel becomes a just Israel as a as a uh, as an exist extant entity. The fact of the existence of Israel becomes a major force for uh, not moral good, but divine justice good, divine uh, you know teleology, the the realization of the divine plan for the cosmos. Uh, it's a, it couldn't be more important. Uh, and this is where you get the stuff that is often referred to as Christian evangelicalism, which is not. There is, you know, it's a, there's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Christian Zionism, which is generally not Zionism. It generally doesn't, I mean, Zionism is about um, creating and maintaining a powerful, thriving Jewish state in uh, all or part of historical Palestine. This is not about that. This is about uh ushering forth, helping to bring forward the giant war and conflagration that will lead to the wiping out of all people who are not, not just Christians, not the right kind of Christians, and the ruling of uh, God on earth again. And uh, it's, it's a, a really kind of sort of divine genocide that's being yearned for here by many people. And it, 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 this narrative begins in the 70s also. And it persists to this day. People talk about it all the time. Um, so certainly, you get at this point, um, you know, the the the, the int real intensification of, of uh, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian uh, themes in American culture. But things start to happen on the ground in the Middle East and get reflected in the news coverage in the United States that that undermine that simple narrative. Of, of goodies, Israelis versus baddies, Palestinians and other Arabs. And the first big blow to this is the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the, uh, the Sabran Shatila massacres. I mean, this was, this was perceived as uh, brutal, uh, as um, disproportionate, as indefensible, uh, a lot of um, Jewish um, dismay at this behavior, a lot of um, disquiet in Israel about the, the, um, the whole mission and particularly the Sabran Shatila massacre, a sense that Ariel Sharon had committed a huge war crime. And all of this really shifted the narrative. You suddenly saw Palestinians, Lebanese and other Arabs as victims of uh, Israeli brutality for the first time, and uh, the the narrative of Israel David versus the Arab Muslim Goliath became deeply problematized, to say the least. Right, and then that was even more 
undermined by the first intifada, which was, you know, in 1987, which was a grassroots, um, so popular uprising against um, occupation and the sort of system of uh, brutal apartheid that Israel and colonialism that Israel does run in the occupied territories from people on the ground. Uh, without the leadership of, of the PLO directly in the beginning, because they were then uh, exiled to Tunis after 1982, and before the emergence of Hamas, uh, which happened during, uh, but not prior to the first Intifada. So it was very spontaneous. And it was at the beginning and through most of it, almost entirely nonviolent or violent in the sense of throwing stones or something that amounts basically to symbolic acts of violence, certainly not nonviolent, but, uh, but that is not a militarized conflict. It, it, militarization starts to creep in at the end of the first intifada when the PLO is returning to the, uh, on the ground in, in, in uh, the occupied territories and you get the emergence of Hamas and the thing becomes much more structured, organized, and you can see the origins of the militarized second intifada. Uh, but most of the first intifada was about Israeli troops beating and, and under Rabin, who was the, the, the defense minister at the time in Israel, uh, the policy for oppression was generally broken bones. So if a Palestinian a protester, especially a rock thrower was captured, troops were ordered to break their bones, break their arms or break their legs uh, in order to incapacitate them and in order to punish them. And the brutality of this was remarkable. And it, you know, it really, now we have the total flip of the David and Goliath narrative. It's not possible to look at the first intifada and, and Americans did, the Americans who bother with the news did look at it uh, and see the Israelis as David and these unarmed Palestinian youths with maybe rocks or not even rocks, uh, you know, as Goliath and see them as terrorists and see them as anything else. They emerged for the first time as people with agency with a cause, with a just cause, with a, uh, you know, as victims, but not passive victims like the refugees, right? The big difference, but victims who are fighting for their rights and universal rights of, of freedom, of citizenship, of justice, of, of basically being able to live their lives like anybody else. This is a real turning point. I really think the first intifada is, is the actual biggest turning point in American perceptions. Uh, of Palestine and Palestinians, because it, it, well, it doubts grew in 82. Uh, there were all kinds of mitigations and all kinds of ways of parsing it. 87 and 88, the first thing to find out, there was no way around it. And for people who are willing to consider the reality, the new reality, it became obvious to them that the old narrative uh, about Israel good, Palestinians bad, uh, was not working. And the Palestinians as active freedom fighters emerged, not, not terrorists who say they're freedom fighters, not Arafat with the gun in, in, uh, in the UN in Geneva, but you know, kids with stones and, and people just wanting their freedom. Uh, that emerges for the first time. And that has had a tremendous impact on where we are today. Um, in between 93 and 2000, um, you, you have then, I think, the emergence, uh, 93 being the year of Oslo, right, post-Cold post War, and the emergence of areas A, B, and C in, in the occupied territories and the creation of the Palestinian Authority and the, the so-called peace process, which has now died a, uh, a tragic and uh, an ignominious death, really, um, at the hands mainly of Netanyahu, but all his other enablers on all sides. Um, but he was never for it, and uh, you know, he has done it in so that his successors cannot uh, revive it for sure, in, at least in its current form. Um, but it's really important because with the Rose Garden signing ceremony between Arafat and Rabin, the creation of a, a full-fledged U.S. diplomatic relationship with the PLO, a, a, a PLO mission in Washington that had achieved until Trump shut it down and threw it out, the status of an embassy, right? Uh, you had then the creation of an image of the Palestinians as not just a people and a cause, but a national movement with a respectable leadership that could be dealt with in, at a diplomatic register, a people who can sign treaties, a people who are there at the UN, not 
you know, making angry speeches, but participating as a non-member observer state, uh, which every state that wanted, that was a non-member observer state that wants to be a member state has become one either on its own or by, through unification, like East Germany and West Germany and, and North and South Vietnam and that kind of stuff. Um, it's very hard to keep anyone who doesn't want to be, uh, doesn't want to go from being a non-member observer state to, you know, out of being uh, a member eventually. Uh, so it's a really important change also, because then you get the notion of Palestinian leaders in the White House, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian president, Palestinian ambassador, Palestinian, you know, so, Really, really, I think, I think very, very important. Uh, and um, that that was built on uh, some of the work we did at the task force in uh, the 2000s. What we were trying to do, among other things, was to mainstream the idea of Palestine and Palestinians in Washington society, in Washington um, discourse and the, the respectable people I and mean, even big supporters of Israel would come to a Palestinian American gala with the Secretary of State or even maybe we came close a couple times we didn't get the president but we came awful close twice uh, speaking that would begin with everyone standing up for Mothini and the Palestinian national anthem and and you know be all about a celebration of Palestine Palestinians Palestinian national uh, Palestinian Americans and their contributions that sort of stuff um, and, and I think we, you know, this is, again, this is something that only concerns the bubble in Washington, what people deride as the blob, the policy framing community, you know, the people here in the think tanks and the political organizations, the lobbyists, the, the foreign policy experts, um, and the people who are in that rotating circle in and out of government jobs, um, you know, all came. And uh, that, that I think did have a big impact. That's my bias, I was part of it, but, but it, it did change something in that little, but all important uh, area. But then you get the second intifada. And the second intifada was disastrous for the reputation of Palestinians because of the, the suicide bombing and the way it was perceived. It was perceived, and, and Palestinians be, it's perceived very negative in the United States to say the least. And, um, uh, it was especially problematic that 9-11 uh, was an instance of suicide terrorism in the United States. It became possible to try to cast Palestinians as, again, back as the vicious terrorists, as the people who, who just want to take lives, and then as the precursors to the 9-11 attack, even though there are no Palestinians involved in 9-11, very few Palestinians playing any role in Al-Qaeda, although you know, there was, um, some predecessors, but very few, um, especially because of their nationalism. But that gets into a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a depth that Americans didn't experience. They saw Palestinian suicide terrorism in the occupied territories and in Israel, and then they saw it here in the United States, and they made the connection. And there was this footage, which those of you who were around at the time will remember, of a tiny group of people supposedly dancing in the West Bank. No one was ever to, able to authenticate it or trace it and, and being happy. And then some shopkeeper offering a cameraman some sweets. And it was all not clear what it was, where this came from or what it was. And, you know, the pro-Israel voices in the United States went crazy on those videos saying, ah, you see these people, they love that attack on the United States. They hate us. Their Al-Qaeda is just a pro-Palestinian thing, or, or, you know, this is the root of it all or something like that, right? And, and that was really, really very damaging. Uh, so the, in, uh, the post 9-11 shift was really bad for uh, Palestinians in the United States because you had a shift away from anti-Arab stereotypes, which often focused on Palestinians, to a much more vicious kind of Islamophobia. In other words, the target went from an ethnicity to a religious group, and it, it became much more, uh, much more vicious. Uh, and Palestinians were often portrayed, or the cause of Palestine, as the ultimate form of uh, Muslim viciousness, irrationality, badness, et cetera, like that. And the other thing is, and this is really worse in a way, the, the uh, media shifted from the entertainment industry to the news media. So that it was no longer necessary to make a movie like Exodus or a movie like, I don't know, uh, Siege or something to be uh, 
uh, or all the Golan Globus films of the 80s, is this Israeli movies that used to come out in the United States. It wasn't necessary to make those. You could just go on TV, go on CNN or Fox or anything uh, and say flat out, these are bad people. And these are the terrorists, and it's all down to Islam, and the worst of them are the Palestinians, and the worst of them love the Palestinians, and, and just mix the whole thing up in a, in a kind of giant ball. And that, I think, did a great deal of harm. So you got then the uh, revivification of the uh, theme of terrorists, but, but greatly intensified, right? Greatly seen, seen not as a cartoonish villain, but as a real threat and a threat not to people over there, a threat to us Americans because they hate us for who we are and all that stuff. You also get the rise of uh, discourse about um, the PLO and the PA as corrupt and despotic and uh, dysfunctional and incompetent. Uh, and you could make the case that it is all those things. But the point is you get, you know, Palestinians are seen as kind of now being painted because uh, things are not good in the occupied territories, even in area A, as if they had, you know, a lot of authority. But it, that is so often so sort of pointed out directly or indirectly as, as, as evidence that Palestinians are really not fit to run them, to run their uh, societies and and uh, have to prove there's a, people are willing still willing to say they have to prove that they can be peaceful and friendly and effective and good governance and all of that so it comes out of this period certainly uh, the, the idea of the Palestinian as a brainwashed fanatic right and an unthinking agent of violence and chaos is there in the 70s and 80s and 90s but it really becomes much more pronounced in after the second intifada and and it's more dangerous when that comes out in news analysis form or in debate we you know rather than in you know encoded in a movie and and i think that's what you get uh after the the uh, 9 11 the second intifada and 9 11 which kind of mix together but at the same time i think what we've seen is um since 2016 in the Trump era, there has been the, the, the a flowering of the seeds that were sown in 1982 and especially in 1987 uh, of seeing, viewing the Palestinians through a different narrative, a narrative of racism and colonialism, a narrative of um, sympathy, empathy, of full humanity, and of seeing them as uh, the latest victims of a history of uh, the abuse of non-white people by white people, the identification of Israelis, fairly or unfairly, as just another European colonial movement, another settler state, uh, and uh, the Palestinians as their brown victims right now. It used to be the case. The, the Israeli government and their friends and Zionists and their allies had spent a lot of time in the 50s, especially in the 60s, 70s, 80s, creating a, uh, a, a, a kind of conflation of Israel and Israelis and Americans in the United States and kind of presenting Israel as a pioneer state fighting nature and the savages to create a great country uh, against the wishes of these barbaric people, et cetera, et cetera. And that had helped them for a long time. But in now in the sort of era of uh, progressive and as its uh, critics would call it woke progressivism, uh, which is very strong on identity and very strong, maybe even too strong on totalizing narratives and analogies, Palestinians emerge as the, the heroes for the first time. They, they, the Palestinian narrative of history has a deep seated mainstream cultural resonance in the United States on the progressive left for the first time. You used to have, you know, people on the far right, the David Duke, who were sort of pre pretending to be pro-Palestinian. They were really just looking for a way of being anti-Semitic. This is genuinely pro-Palestinian without being anti-Semitic. I think sometimes it can bleed into that, but for the most part, it's not that at all. Um, and that's a very new uh, way of looking at things. And you, you, it is partly the result of uh, an accumulation of impressions that began in 82 and 87. It's partly the result of a lot of hard work on the part of activists do, for decades to tell this story uh, of Palestinians and their friends. It's partly the result of a new generation of Americans and Jewish Americans 
rethinking uh, their perception of these issues. It's partly a result of Israel's, uh, you know, the outrageousness of Israel's conduct during the occupation of pretending to want to make a two-state agreement. And then like Lucy with the football, pulling it away every time. Yeah, no. And, uh, you know, people under they come to understand what's going on. You just, you can't fool them for that long. Uh, and uh, so I do think there is a greater understanding now. And you can see in the polls. I don't think it helps Palestinians much for the, 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 the metric that poll watchers tend to go to is who do you sympathize with more, Israelis or Palestinians? I mean, that doesn't really matter in terms of policy. And it's sort of a silly question, um, you know, in a way. Uh, but I think it does, it does give us a sense of where the culture is going. And uh, I think one of the few things that um, the, the right says it is true is culture is downstream from politics. They love to say that. And, and uh, oh, sorry, politics is downstream from culture, forgive me. Uh, and uh, cultural changes really do have a big impact in the long run on, on, um, uh, on policy. I was going to talk about the structures that allowed news reporting uh, to be so biased for so long. Uh, they're interesting, but they're not as interesting as this little story that I've told you uh, about American perceptions of Palestine. And uh, so, you know, the erasure of Palestine is more complete than ever on the ground, right? The, the prospect of a Palestine, an independent Palestine, anywhere meaningful, I don't know, maybe the Emirate of Gaza or something, but no, something serious uh, in, in, say, in the occupied territories uh, is further away than ever. Uh, but uh, the comprehension of Palestine as a real and existing place, thing, cause, people, truth in the American uh, culture is stronger than ever. There's, there's an irony for you. And that's where we are today. All the themes that I talked about, the unknown Palestinian, the pathetic refugee, the generic Arab with all the bad Arab traits, the generic Muslim with all the generic Islamophobic uh, attributed uh, traits, especially terrorism, the corrupt and despotic uh, Oriental, the uh, brainwashed unthinking automaton, and now the victim of racism and colonialism, all of those are there still to this day in our culture. And that's basically the, the soup, the bubbling frothy soup that makes up this, uh, this little tale in my view. I'm gonna stop here. Uh, fascinating. I, I, I would like to hear more about uh, you know, your analysis of news media, but sure. uh, uh, if you wanna take uh, you know, five more minutes to do that, go right ahead. But, okay, uh, I, I, will, I will mention it. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. It's worth saying, because I, I think that uh, for a long time, Americans were, and even to this day, Americans are very well exposed to the Israeli, not just the Israeli narrative, but Israeli experience. When, when things happen in Israel, they're very well reported on by the American news, and they're much discussed. Uh, one of the reasons is there is a very strong and powerful Jewish and now Christian evangelical uh, set of voices, set of, of uh, cultural forces that are attuned to those uh, experiences and amplify them in the United States. So that's the first thing. And you don't, you haven't had that. Now, increasingly, it does happen in the United States on, the, on, on behalf of Palestinians. But historically, it's been very strong. The Israeli experience has been not just the narrative, but the daily experience of something bad happens in Israel. Americans hear about it and they hear about it in detail and they hear about it right away and they hear about it in a personalized manner. It's not, oh, five people got killed when a bomb. No, it's this is the name of that child. And this woman was going to end her and the ironies and the sadness and the tragedy. And they would hear all about that, which is great, but you know, it was very one-sided. Um, and that's increasingly less the case, still true, but much less the case. Every time there is a bombardment of, of uh, Gaza, I think there's more and more appreciation in the United States of the toll that ordinary Palestinians are taking. Whatever people think of Hamas is another story, but you know, the, the killing of these people, the destruction of this property uh, is 
is is covered in a way that reflects more of an appreciation of the experience. You see that from the New York Times. These videos, uh, about which I, I'm sure you're aware of if you follow this issue carefully, that the New York Times did tracing a series of, of bombing strikes by Israel in Gaza in the last spasm of violence a few weeks ago, really annoyed uh, Israelis and Israelis who don't usually go in for crude Hasbara anymore, uh, crude propaganda. Um, you know, people who try to play it straight most of the time uh, were moved to really complain bitterly and say, oh, no, no, you know, really kick up a fuss because they knew a nerve was being struck here. You know, the, the, the New York Times article with, with the uh, picture of all the dead children from the conflict on the front page of the New York Times, that caused howls of outrage from people, again, who usually try to, 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 to contain uh, their role as a propagandist. I think there's a very powerful Israeli state propaganda uh, media and nothing similar on the Palestinian side. Palestinians have been, not Palestinian Americans so much, but the PLO and other Palestinian institutions have been inept at messaging, I think, generally, at least messaging to Americans. And then finally, there's this, which is American journalists in the region have been based in West Jerusalem. So they've lived as Israelis. They've lived Israeli lives. Access to Israel and Israelis is easy and quick and simple. And uh, to Palestine and Palestinians is not so much. And that skews things as well. There is much more, but I'll stop at that. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the campaign to make, uh, to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Mm. Uh, and, you know, uh, silencing uh, those of us uh, who are vocal about the issue and and its impact on trying to erase sure. uh, more of the, this Palestinian existence? Yeah, I mean, it, it. what it does is it stigmatizes a very common natural perception. I mean, in other words, look, we don't have a narrative yet to uh, easily marry the Israeli narrative and the Palestinian narrative. So if you cathec, if you if you invest emotionally in the Palestinian narrative, your impulse is going to be to be an anti-Zionist, right? That is going to be a natural response to a legitimate fact-based narrative about real experiences. And to stigmatize that as uh, being primarily either an intention or in fact the negation of another people really sort of bars the the basic building blocks of Palestinian national identity and sympathy for it. I will say, so it's it's a kind of erasure in that sense. It basically says, don't go there. Don't go into that space because it will be, you will be doing something immoral. Uh, and I don't think we can allow people to bully us into that. I do think this though, I think also it requires enormous vigilance to make sure that anything that does smack of anti-Semitism, and you see it, it's not BDS, it's not calling for boycott, that's not anti-Semitism, but anything that tends to stigmatize uh, Jews or even all Israelis as, as somehow uh, tainted is very dangerous. And uh, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a powerful weapon. It's used all the time because it's a powerful weapon. The only way to defang it is to do two things simultaneously to expose its fallacy and the intention of simply uh, barring any real engagement with the Palestinian experience and narrative, at, at the same time being very clear about what you won't accept uh, people to say in, in the course of supposedly supporting Palestine and Palestinians, because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Um, the other issues, you know, the, you know, the, the line that uh, you know many Israeli uh, pro-Israel groups use, and Israeli officials use in the media that um, as they're bombing Gaza, they're saying, "Well, it's all about uh, Hamas trying to destroy Israel, yep. not accepting Israel's right to exist." Uh, where do you see that uh, issue? Uh, well, it's not working that well because even people who say yeah, we don't really like Hamas, or we think that Hamas uh, didn't have to uh, intervene in the uh, violence in Jerusalem, or who think it was a bad idea, or who have problems with Hamas's agenda. It doesn't matter what you think of Hamas. Uh, 
That this was disproportionate is undeniable. That it was, I mean, whether it was discriminatory or indiscriminate, this guy from, uh, from Anura got in a lot of trouble for saying that he didn't think it was terribly indiscriminate, right? But, but what people missed is he wasn't saying it wasn't disproportionate. He wasn't saying it wasn't uh, um, cruel and deliberately kind of um, uh, mass punishment. He was saying that the, generally the rockets fell where they wanted them to fall. That was not actually a nice thing to say about the Israelis because a lot of places were bombed that shouldn't Certainly, even if you accept that logic that, oh, you know, this is a self-defensive thing, which I think is very, I mean, it's easily debunked. But uh, the, the more to the point is that uh, the Israelis themselves have talked about the need to uh, make people of Gaza pay a price for what Hamas does. They have talked about uh, conflating the Palestinian civilians, most of the refugees in Gaza with, with Hamas, making no difference between the two. And especially they have said, and this is where it's been most open, is that we need to target the uh, Gaza elite who are not with Hamas, but who have some money and some businesses and things. We need to blow up their buildings. We need to blow up their homes. We need to blow up their businesses. So that puts pressure on Hamas not to annoy us or provoke us or do anything we don't like. And it, it really is uh, impossible to justify this. So I, I think it, it the, the, but it's Hamas argument. The main effect of it was to get the Gulf countries, UAE and Bahrain off the hook because they were squirming and suffering about the violence in Al-Aqsa and uh, in Sheikh Jarrah. And they were having a very hard time with that. They were issuing statements. Uh, once it became that they could say, uh, you know, to their people, oh, but this is Hamas versus Netanyahu, they're all nuts. You know, it became a sort of dodge for them. But I think in the United States, it doesn't, it doesn't play in the public well at all anymore. People have heard that story. And as the New York Times coverage indicated, it wasn't working. Um, I, I find it fascinating the way you explain that on the ground, it's getting worse. We see the yep. erasure, but the comprehension of Palestine in America is actually getting stronger. Much stronger. Is there enough time to catch up to reverse what's happening on the ground? Uh, Reverse it? No, I don't think it can be reversed. There is, here's the thing about reality. Reality keeps changing. Things keep happening. Nothing stays the same. So that means that things can either stay the way they are, but you know, the, 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 the relative proportion of good and bad can stay the way it is, or they can get worse, or they can get better. There are lots of ways they can get better, right? We used to want uh, Arabs and Palestinians for decades dreamed of reversing 1948 and recreating the Palestinian society that existed before the Nakba. It became obvious that wasn't going to happen. Then there was a dream of the Palestinian state, and that now seems a distant dream. There are people who dream of a single united democratic state. Lovely. Uh, it seems very far off. There are, uh, But the point is, I think at this point, we don't know what exactly the framework for liberation and freedom is going to look like. I don't know anyone who knows what it's going to look like. But I also think very few sensible people look at this situation and say, oh, yeah, this will work. <laughs> this is nice and stable. This is tenable. This is, a, this is a perfectly workable relationship. This arrangement, this is fine. I don't know anyone sensible who thinks that. So you can go, I mean, you can keep the ball in the air for a while. Uh, and it probably will stay in the air for a while, but eventually we're either going to move towards some new model of coexistence, whatever it's going to be. It probably won't look like too much else that we've seen in the world. Probably going to have to be a sui generis um, answer for a sui generis conflict. Or the other big, the big fear I have is that is that there is a de facto um, unilateral Israeli solution, which is the imposition of new borders that are supposedly final borders that involves ethnic cleansing for a third time. We had it in 1947-48. We had it in 1967. 15, 20 years ago, I would have said you can't get away with that anymore. But surely now you can. I mean, we live in a very anarchic world, more anarchic than during the Cold War. Now there's an opportunity to do stuff that is very outrageous and, and people are not going to intervene. So I think that that is the other direction we could go in. And it's a very ugly one. And there's 
I think that the thing to do is to, uh, yes, we can all work together to make things better and make sure that the uh, change is in a positive and not in a negative direction. What the plan, the big plan, I can't tell you because I can't think of anyone where this is a straight line from here to there. In any event, there would be multiple phases. And I don't know anyone who is uh, prescient enough to understand where exactly we're going. I certainly think it's easy to tell what you shouldn't do. Uh, but much harder to know where we're going. What you should do is also not hard to tell, but where it's going to take us is a little bit more murky. Uh, we have a few questions from our audience and anyone okay. else would like to ask a question, just go ahead and type it in, your, uh, in the chat space. Uh, first question deals with moving the needle in DC. And yeah. uh, you know, Hussein, we meet a lot of people and they understand the Palestinian issue and staffers of members of Congress, and staffers of the White yeah. House and the State Department, they get it and they, they know what's going on. Yet the ones who speak uh, at the podium, they just, they're, they're reading a script. Yes. Um, but you're, you're talking about uh, progressives changing the narrative. Yeah. Do you see it, do you see this shifting in terms of the narrative? Yeah, it is shifting. Okay, it is shifting. It's not, maybe I think a lot of people aren't aware of it because they don't look at it as gran in as granular a fashion. Um, it's shifting in both directions. It's shifting in a very bad way and it's shifting in a very good way. Uh, there was a, con since, you know, from the founding of the Israeli state, there were a series of consensus positions on Israel that united most Democrats and most Republicans. There was an isolationist wing of the Republican Party in the 50s and 60s that didn't want to have anything to do with you know, foreign countries, including the Israelis. There were some people left enough to have doubts. But in the main, between 48 and 67, there was kind of you know guarded support for Israel, but a willingness to intervene in 1956 and say, no, you go back to Israel and get out of Sinai. You know, it wasn't this unthinking lockstep cooperation from 67 until uh you know so sort of the the end of the cold war there was this this notion of supporting israel but increasingly seeing that israel would benefit from the creation of and the united states would benefit from the creation of a palestinian state in the occupied territory so uh support for a a an israel based two state solution this is the crucial thing right uh, the, the us support for a two state solution was always mainly a, uh, a function of a pro-Israel orientation. It wasn't a pro-Palestine orientation. It was a pro-Israel orientation. It was a way Americans, on, on most American politicians understood Israel's best interests under the uh, guidance of, of various Israeli uh, thinkers and some politicians, but mostly you know, commentators. Anyway, the point is there was a real consensus for that. And uh, it's in the Trump era that we've seen the breaking of that of that third consensus, which you know was very long, long lasting, and on the right you have this evangelical-driven support for annexation, for greater Israel, absolute rejection of Palestinian statehood, and a real embrace of uh, ex the most extreme vision of, of the settlers. I don't know how you reach those constituencies, how you reach the the America firsters. Who, who are kind of like um, religious neoconservatives on steroids. I, I really am not sure how to reach them. Uh, there is this core of two staters in the center, uh, people like the, the Republicans in the Senate, most of them, most of them, and uh, Biden and the people immediately around him who would like to somehow revive a two state solution, but they don't know how because it's, it's not really possible, uh, given especially after Trump. And then on the, uh, on the left, you have voices that are pushing the whole Democratic Party uh, to the left on this issue and to a greater appreciation of the Palestinian cause. So you had, yes, you had voices of the progressive left, uh, people like uh, AOC and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and, and uh, others, even Bernie Sanders in a very attenuated way, speaking out, um, you know, really questioning the idea that this is a legitimate self-defense uh, by Israel during the last uh, bombardment of Gaza. But you had also, and this is a crucial thing, you had die-hard pro-Israel Democrats, die-hard ones, issuing statements that, yes, Israel has a right to defend itself, yes, but we're very concerned 
about the loss of life. We're very concerned about Sheikh Jarrah. We're very concerned about the Al-Aqsa Mosque. We're very, very bothered by these. I mean, these are statements you could never have imagined. Bob Menendez signing, and he did. Jerry Nadler and Chuck Schumer signing, and they did. These are not random American. These are not random Democrats. These are Israel's strongest backers. And something has happened in the party. You know, the, the progressive left and uh, the way in which the Republicans have gone evangelical, greater Israel annexationists has, have combined to squeeze that democratic center into a more, uh, into a position where they're much more willing to criticize Israeli policies within, within certain reason. And if that f continues, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of change over time. Uh, another question from our audience. What advice do you have for reaching the hearts and minds of evangelical Christians, especially- I'm the wrong person. <laughs> I, know. I don't know. But there's, there's I saying, don't know. Uh, this person has family members who are evangelical. Yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I guess you, you, you'd have to use your own scriptures. I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not good at convincing very devout people of things because I don't have the toolkit, the scriptural toolkit. They're not going to listen to my to my political arguments, right? No, I don't, sure. I don't think I don't I don't think they'll listen to anyone. Well, maybe not. Indeed, they may not, but they might be moved by human stories. But you know, the problem is, as they say, with God, all things are possible. The flip side is, with God, all things can be permissible, mm -hmm. because if it's all part of a divine plan, who are we to judge? And that can be very dangerous. Yes, that is. Um, uh, a question regarding, uh, you, you monitor the Gulf. Uh, I do. Uh, and you, you follow uh, events there very closely. Yes, I do. In terms of what Bahrain and UAE did, mm. isn't that part of also erasing uh, Palestinian existence because they, they signed an accord that really had nothing to do with Palestinians? It, I, no, I don't think so. I think it has to do with, I think it had to do with shattering the Palestinian strategy, uh, which is bad enough. I don't think it does anything to erase Palestine particularly. Uh, it, you know, I mean, the, the fact is Israel is not going anywhere. So you can either deal with it covertly or you can deal with it as a matter of, of undeniable need like the Jordanians and the Egyptians, or you can try not to deal with it. But, but I think uh, a country a country like the UAE is so bound up in regional affairs. They're, they're going to be dealing with it. Saudi Arabia deals with Israel covertly. It, it, Egypt, uh, sorry, Turkey deals with it overtly, but then they have this pattern of angry talk, but it's all talk because if you look at the trade and the military links, they're, they're very robust. So, I mean, it's, it's a reality in a very finely balanced strategic region and people are going to deal with it one way or the other. I think, and I don't buy the line that they had done anything to, help the Palestinians by preventing annexation, right? Actually help Trump and the Israelis. This was the rationale of, of the UAE, that this, this saves the uh, Arab peace initiative, and I'll explain what I mean, and, and saves the prospect of the two-state solution. Uh, it sounds good, but it's not right. They were looking for an opportunity to do this. They'd been looking for two years for an opportunity to do it, and then they found one and they did it. Now, um, I think uh, it's them operating strictly in their own national interest, right? Now, uh, they have many good reasons for doing this. They have, I, I calculated one time, 11 or 12 rational reasons that they would do this. Bahrain has one, they're scared of Iran. But, but um, the UAE has a bu bunch of reasons for it. Now, what it does that's so bad to the Palestinians is it exposes the failure of the leadership really brutally. Because after the peace process finally fell apart, which was the last gasp of it was in the first Obama term, when Obama demanded a using, using the roadmap that had been constructed by the Middle East Quartet under, uh, under Bush, he said, we'll implement phase one of the roadmap. And the first thing Israel has to do is a total settlement freeze. And he demanded it. So the Palestinians demanded it. I was on really good terms with the Palestinian leadership at the time. And we were all telling them, don't make this a cornerstone, give yourself an out, give yourself a back door. So if the, because the Americans are not gonna be able to get these rights to do this. They could, but Obama is not gonna pay the price. He's not gonna spend the political capital. He, he convinced Netanyahu to do this, it's gonna be really hard. And he's not gonna wanna do it. 
so it's not going to happen. So don't put yourself in that corner. But they did. Okay, why should they listen to us? And they didn't. But I mean, it was good advice. Uh, the point is, after that, there was no way back. Uh, and there hasn't been a way back, especially since Netanyahu doesn't want a way back. Now, in lieu of that, what did the PLO and leading Palestinian representatives and officials say, diplomats and others, say was their national strategy? In second Obama term and going into, uh, you know, into Trump and all that, it was the API, the Arab Peace Initiative that was introduced by Saudi Arabia in 2002, which basically made a link between um, uh, recognition of Israel and ending the occupation, right? And and it was it was structured so that uh, the uh, collective Arab recognition of Israel was a sweetener to come at the end of a successful uh, two state solution agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, it's that it was fine insofar as it went, but the big problem was when it became the Palestinian national strategy de facto. Right? When you ask these Palestinian leaders, "What's your national strategy?" behind closed doors, down and dirty. Right. What, what are you guys doing? They would either say the Arab Peace Initiative or they would describe the Arab Peace Initiative without using those three words. Right? And so I'm thinking to myself, that that's really risky. It's really risky to put your national strategy in the hands of lots of other countries that have their own interests and may redefine it. May, they're not abandon it, but they'll redefine it in a way that's not useful to you. And that's exactly what happened with the UAE. So basically, I think in a way it's disastrous, but also it's an opportunity for the Palestinians in the sense that they, they were using the API, which didn't really function, as a, as a substitute for a national strategy. And now they don't have a national strategy, they need to get one. The problem is to get a national strategy, you need a national leadership. And right now they don't have a strong consensus national leadership. There is a guy who is the mayor of Ramallah, who is, calls himself the president, Palestine, but he's the mayor of Ramallah. And, uh, and there's uh, Hamas in Gaza, whatever, however you want to characterize them, that's fine. Uh, but neither of them are functional national leaderships. And it's, therefore, there's no national strategy. And that makes progress at a diplomatic level almost impossible. And, uh, you know, so in, in that sense, it, it may have been a painful amputation that was necessary, because this was all going to blow up at some point. It was a, it was a, there's something fraudulent about the whole thing, and, and it's probably good to break the illusion. Um, you know, we've really taken a lot of your time, but I have one last question. Oh, I'm happy to stay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you and I have been working in Washington for so long, and we know that uh, Arabs, uh, Arab Americans need not apply for policy yeah. positions in the government, uh, especially in the State Department. However, there was Changing. a lot yeah, there was a minor change that, uh, I don't know if it was uh, tectonic or it was just uh, throwing us a bone, but uh, the appointment of ha Hadi Amr yeah. as President Biden's envoy uh, on this issue. How do, you, how do you interpret that? Movie? It's not tectonic. It's more gradualism on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, there's still a big sign saying Arabs need not apply. On the Democratic side, there is a sign saying Arabs need not apply for senior jobs. But what Hadi got, Hadi, I should say, is, is an, a really great Arab American um, development official, basically. Comes out of USAID, which is a, a, the development appendage of the State Department. So he's an American diplomat, in effect. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a mid level diplomat. He's not, he's not a very senior guy. He could be, I mean, look, if Jared Kushner can be, you know, uh, May and, and, and uh, Fried, David Friedman and Jason Greenblatt can be, can be bumped up, anyone. I mean, you know, it's just your, your friend, the mailman could be, no problem. But, you know, in, in, we're back in, a, in a, 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 an administration that values regular order and works through the system as it is. So, so he could be empowered, but it would be very weird if he were. Okay, um, it is important that an Arab American is carrying the portfolio, but it's problematic that the portfolio is small. You know, in other words, by appointing Hadi, you put an Arab American in. This is great. But by appointing Hadi, you put a development guy in, which means it's a development project, which means it's all about aid and all about the, you know, the restoration of the level. It's gonna be, I mean, I've looked at the program in detail. They wanna get back to about $900 million a year to 
not to the PA because of the, this Taylor Force Act that was passed uh, during Trump, they really can't give money directly to the PA. That's not that big a problem because you can fund things and, and groups that are doing stuff in Palestine that's helpful to people in hospitals and schools. And that's all fine. That's fine. So they're going to do that. Um, but ultimately, uh, if you want to take it further, you would need to either empower him or you'd need someone more senior. The other thing is there are now increasingly Arab Americans in other lower level positions, but not you know junior, ones, mid-level positions. I mean, I, I know three uh, serious Arab Americans who are waiting for jobs, who are turning down speaking engagements because they're waiting for jobs. And they're real jobs, they're, they're policy jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a closed door. It's a closed door at the most senior level. All of this, I mean, it's still the case that the Arab Americans and the, and the American Muslims have not organized themselves politically sufficiently. And you need that in the American system. You need a bunch of either money or voters to move this stuff. This is, this is a, uh, the First Amendment, the, maybe in a way, is the most important part of it is the most overlooked part, the right to petition the government for the redress of grievances. Mm -hmm. That means this government is set up to be lobbied. <laughs> that means votes and money will move it. And if you come to the table with good ideas and brilliance and insight and good intentions and everyone loves you and you got no votes and no money, that's lovely. And they'll do what Colin Powell did when he was Secretary of State and he came and met with us when I was at ADC. And we talked to him and he said, this was during the Second Intifada, before 9-11. And he said, I agree with 90%, 85% of what you've told me, but I don't have political cover to get you almost any of that. You got to get us political cover. Right. This is an honest, truthful statement. Yeah. Same thing happened in the situation in Bosnia. We went and spoke yeah. to the NSC and they said, yeah, we agree with you now. Where, where are your constituents? Yeah. How, how are you going to force us to do it? Where's the leverage? Where's yeah. the leverage? Where's my, you could, yeah, you could do it. Where's the leverage? How do you lift me up? Like, what Powell was using was the analogy of cover. What, how, how am I defending myself? Who, you know, what how do what do happened it? to uh, the American Task Force for Palestine? You know, we were set up uh, we operate for 10 years. We were set up with the goal of making a two-state solution and end to the occupation a priority for American foreign policy. Priority means one of the top three or four issues. Otherwise, it, it just can't be done. And I think we made headway on the goal of mainstreaming the words Palestine and Palestinian and the concept of Palestine in Washington um, power circles. That was successful. But in terms of prioritizing the policy, it did get prioritized, but not because of us, right? And we didn't really, I mean, we we're useful in carrying messages and being people, whatever, but we played a role, but it happened because Bush second term and Obama first term wanted to get into it, right? For whatever reason, they both engaged in it. Okay. Uh, by the time Obama second term um, was well underway, it became really clear that there was no immediate prospect for um, making this a priority. John Kerry was basically told, you wanted to do this, you're on your own. I think it's ridiculous. And, and you know, it was very hard to imagine uh, either Hillary or Trump or any other Republican or Democrat changing their minds. And indeed Biden has not. Biden wants to make this a back burner issue too, right? That, the big lesson of all of this that American politicians have taken away is this is a, 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 a big losing issue, which is really tragic. So what we could have done, we had developed a system there to sustain ourselves at our current level. We could have kept going, but it would have meant raising about a million dollars a year uh, for all of our expenses uh, to pursue a mission that was not going to happen. So we thought, you know what, we can always reform if the, if the issue becomes relevant again. Uh, but we were, we were tasked, we tasked ourselves with a very narrow task that was no longer plausible. Move on. Don't bang your head on the wall. Don't move on, do something else. Yeah. That's what we did. We're not, I mean, we're not a social services. There's a lot of important work to do in the West Bank on the ground. We had no, we had no apparatus to do it. There's education work in the United States, no apparatus to do it. Lobbying work, we're not a lobbying. Group. We were just there to talk to the policy community. And if you couldn't possibly get into the top three or four or five issues, uh, it, you know, there's no point. If we know we're going to fail, why would we try? And we didn't. Plus, well, you know, people can spend their money better than giving us money for salaries for a failed project.
Well, I would have felt bad asking people to, to, to donate to a mission, a doomed mission. Well, I'm sure that it's, uh, we'll find uh, you involved in more uh, in, impactful and... Uh, uh, well, I never stopped writing about Palestine. I never stopped advocating and talking about it, even though I you know, now write these columns and I work for a Gulf-oriented think tank and all that. I, I won't let the issue go. I can't let the issue go. And that's never going to happen. Well, we thank you for that. And we thank you for, you know, if, if everybody else can join me, I'm going to put my applause uh, emoji on my screen. Everybody uh, else, please uh, uh, give a, a warm round of applause for uh, Hussein Ibish. This is outstanding, uh, eye-opening uh, history of the, I think you called it the characterization, yeah. char characterization uh, of, uh, of the Palestinian. Yeah. And I think that's, that's that's a class in, a, in and of itself. You gave us a wonderful class, uh, a wonderful way of leading uh, our lecture series, and uh, uh, you you know you, you you've been great, and I hope to see you in Washington. And I look forward to it, Senator. Thank, right. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Next week we'll be talking about war crimes. Is the United States culpable, uh, and where does international law stand in terms of that culpability? That'll be next week. Uh, hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum.